Lieutenant Colonel Retired Richard E. Dick Cole was born on September 7, 1915 in Dayton, Ohio, and had an early interest in aviation. He would ride his bicycle to McCook Field to get a glimpse of famous aviators, Jimmy Doolittle among them. Cole enlisted in the Army on November 22, 1940. He was accepted into the Army Air Corps and graduated in 1941 from advanced flying training at Kelly Field, Texas. He was commissioned as a second lieutenant in July and assigned to the 17th Bombardment Group in Pendleton, Oregon. After the attack on Pearl Harbor, the group began anti-submarine patrols off the coast of Oregon and Washington. In late January 1942, the group was transferred to Columbia, South Carolina. It was here that Cole volunteered for a top secret mission under the command of Lieutenant Colonel Jimmy Doolittle. Following intensive training at Eglin Field in Florida, the crews flew their North American B-25 missiles to California in April 1942, where 16 aircraft were loaded onto the aircraft carrier USS Hornet. On April 18th, only four months after the Pearl Harbor attack, the Doolittle Raiders accomplished the first air raid on Japan. Cole had the enormous responsibility of being the co-pilot of the number one B-25 piloted by Doolittle himself. Launching 250 miles earlier than planned because a Japanese fishing boat had spotted them, all 16 aircraft had to ditch or crash land after striking their targets. They did not have enough fuel to make it to their intended Chinese landing sites. Catching a rare tailwind blowing east to west, Cole's aircraft was able to make it over land. Bailing out over China into the pitch black void, Cole spent the remainder of the night sleeping in the tree where he landed. After return to U.S. control, Cole stayed in China and India flying cargo aircraft until he returned home in June 1943. By October that same year, Cole was back in the Pacific Theater with the 1st Air Commando Group India Burma Sector, where he took part in Operation Thursday, the first Allied all-aerial invasion. Cole landed soldiers more than 200 miles behind Japanese defenses to establish an airfield in the midst of enemy-held territory. Awarded three Distinguished Flying Crosses, Cole retired in 1967. He is a command pilot with 5,078 hours in 30 aircraft, including 250 combat missions with 500 combat hours. Please join me in welcoming Lieutenant Colonel Dick Cole, interviewed by Major John Welch. Thank you. Good afternoon, Lieutenant Colonel Cole. Uh, thank you for being here with us today, and we appreciate you uh, taking time out of your busy schedule to spend this week with us. And I know everyone here in the audience is thrilled that you're able to be here to share your story uh, with us. Uh, before I get started, though, uh, I do want to let everyone know that during this interview, really, I'm just going to scratch the surface with Lieutenant Colonel Cole. Uh, he has a tremendous amount of stories to share with you about his time during World War II, but also in life in general. Uh, I wish I could get into his stories uh, flying the hump or doing air commando operations during World War II, and I encourage each of you during the breaks to come up and chat with Lieutenant Colonel Cole and just talk with uh, him. Uh, he's uh, during his 100 years here on Earth, he has done and seen a lot, and he and I have uh, spoken for several hours, and he shared lots of stories with me. And I encourage you, if you have time, to come up and chat with him, and he's uh, uh, thrilled to chat with all of you. So I encourage you to do that during the breaks this week. But Lieutenant yeah. Colonel Cole, we'll just go ahead and get uh, uh, started chatting about uh, the Doolittle Raid. So I'd like to take uh, you... Uh, well, first off, uh, I would like to thank the Air University uh, for having me here. I'm very honored and very humble about being invited. Uh, yeah. Now, I'd like to take you back to your uh, childhood in Ohio and your early years uh, in the Army Air Corps. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about uh, Jimmy Doolittle and your experiences with uh, uh, Jimmy Doolittle? Uh, as a young person, uh, I was born and raised in Dayton, Ohio. And uh, uh, I also was a member of the Airplane Model League of America. 
and I was interested in, uh, my mother and I kept the scrapbook on uh, activities at uh, what was the Army's first test base called McCook Field. Uh, it was a thin bicycle range of uh, where we lived, and uh, I had to, uh, uh, had the uh, privilege of uh, being able to ride over to McCook Field, which was uh, uh, bordered on one side by a river, and uh, you could sit on the river or in a levee and uh, watch what was going on uh, with uh, all the old timers, including Doolittle, uh, in uh, testing uh, uh, what they were supposed to be testing. Yeah. And uh, I, that was my entry into being, uh, wanting to be an aviator in the U.S. Army Air Corps. Uh, uh, my goal uh, wasn't too high because uh, uh, once a month when the payroll was due at Wright Field, they had a, a Curtis Hawk fly over the armored truck from the bank to the field, and, uh, or the field to the bank. And, uh, my uh, goal was uh, being able to uh, become an aviator and go after the bad guys if they wanted to try and get something out of the armored vehicle. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. And um, and then so let's uh, so moving forward to uh, early 1942, just after the Japanese attacked uh, Pearl Harbor. At that time, so you had uh, you and 79 other Raiders uh, and your B-25s boarded the USS Hornet in California, uh, headed to, to Tokyo. So, so now those B-25s, uh, I know you want to share with them a little bit about how the B-25s uh, came to be involved with the Doolittle Raid. Well, uh, as it was, North American was in the process of uh, manufacturing the B-25. And uh, it, uh, by then, uh, they called it a, a low-bid airplane. Uh, uh, and I think maybe uh, uh, North, if North American had it to do over again, uh, they were charging uh, $200,000 for the airplane. That, uh, after it performs so well during the war, they probably would have wanted more money. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. And on that, uh, on April the 18th, 1942, uh, Jimmy Doolittle was uh, the pilot of the aircraft you were in. Uh, how did it come to be that uh, Colonel Doolittle was your pilot that day? Uh, uh, we were stationed at Pendleton, Oregon. Uh, on the, uh, Jan in January of 42, uh, uh, the 17th Bomb Group, uh, which was made up of uh, the 37th Squadron, and the 34th Squadron, and the 95th Squadron, and had an attached uh, squadron uh, called the 89. We had got orders to f go to Columbia, South Carolina. Uh, we traveled there, and uh, on the way uh, to Columbia, uh, the gentleman I was flying with, an instructor pilot, uh, upgraded me to the first pilot, because uh, uh, I had to plan the whole thing and uh, arrive there safely without any hitches. Uh, uh, after we were at Columbia for uh, maybe a week or so, uh, they put out the word where they were looking for uh, volunteers to go on a very dangerous mission. Uh, in, in the meantime, uh, Colonel Doolittle was uh, busy looking around for an airplane to do that. Uh, and. Uh, 
he ended up choosing the B-25. Now, and since we were the only group uh, that uh, were operate that was operational at that time, uh, it ended up that he chose uh, our group, and uh, so all this uh, history or so forth uh, about uh, volunteering and so forth. It, you thought that uh, uh, you were going to be uh, uh, overlooked, maybe, but uh, uh, if you thought that uh, it was going to catch the eye of Colonel Doolittle and uh, we were going to go on the raid, uh, whether we wanted to or not. Uh, <laughs> so, and, and so how did, uh, how did it make you feel uh, having your boyhood hero, Colonel Jimmy Doolittle, uh, be your pilot that day? Uh, I, I, I was very elated and, and I wondered how lucky I could so be that it happened. But uh, to tell you the real story was that the, his original pilot uh, had some kind of a, a co-pilot, had some kind of a, an accident and uh, couldn't go. Uh, the, the morning that uh, 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 he was supposed to come in to uh, uh, Eglin, uh, the pilot that I had uh, he became ill. He got appendicitis. And uh, so uh, the crew and I talked it over, and they still wanted to go on the mission. And so I went to the ops officer who was Ski York uh, and uh, asked, told him the problem and we, because there were already standby crews that are trained. And, and he he uh, said, well, uh, I'll crew you up with the old man and uh, if you uh, do okay, you, you got yourself a pilot. Uh, it turned out that he didn't fire us, and uh, he took the seat of the previous pilot, and uh, we were the baggage that went along with the airplane. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. so tell us what it was like being at the controls of that B-25 on April the 18th, 1942. What was it like looking out the windshield of that B-25, looking at the flight deck of the USS Hornet that morning? <laughs> Well, maybe I should say a little bit about uh, how the uh, B-25 is involved. That, 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 uh, being a little bit airplane, uh, it was designed as a medium bomber, uh, which uh, uh, who was supposed to operate at about from 12,000 to about 18,000 feet. Uh, but, uh, in the meantime, uh, the anti-aircraft uh, industry uh, became more uh, 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 more competent and, and uh, sophisticated. But uh, being in a B-25 at say 15,000 feet uh, wasn't a very good idea, uh, considering uh, uh, so. The end, it ended up mainly as a tank buster, a bridge buster, and uh, uh, it uh, was, uh, what I feel, and I think a lot of people feel, that uh, it was a credit to the aircraft industry of uh, their ability to produce a good, safe, solid airplane. Now, you already said the B-25 was designed as a medium uh, bomber. Uh, so this was, you had never taken off from an aircraft carrier before. Was it scary for you uh, that morning being the very first fully loaded uh, B-25 to take off from the USS Hornet? Well, to be honest, uh, when they first told us that we were going to be taking off from a, a, a carrier, uh, 
Uh, they said, well, I'm not so sure about that. But, uh, <laughs> uh, but after we uh, started training, and uh, uh, Lieutenant uh, Hank Miller from uh, Pensacola came down and uh, showed us how to make a carrier takeoff. Uh, yeah. What he did was uh, figure out right away that uh, the B-25 has uh, a negative uh, angle of attack. And uh, his objective right away was to get the pilots to uh, pull back on the stick enough to get uh, at least to the zero drag. Uh, and uh, he was able to do that, uh, and he rode with each pilot uh, till uh, they, he thought that they either were up or down. Uh, and, uh, uh, the other thing was that uh, uh, we took off several times, fully loaded, uh, as uh, we would be loaded uh, on the carrier. So. Uh, we had uh, at least a, a glimmer of uh, uh, confidence that uh, it could be done. Uh, and considered uh, the wind over the deck and the natural wind, uh, we only needed about 20 knots of uh, propellant uh, to be airborne. Uh, one of the young uh, pilots uh, in a takeoff uh, when we were practicing got off uh, 278 feet. Wow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so um, how long was that flight from the Hornet to Japan? It was about four hours. Uh, uh, on the way there, we, uh, 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 well, for, uh, I should say that uh, uh, for safety of uh, not being seen and so forth, Colonel Dooley wanted to go low level. So we flew from the carrier to Japan uh, about 200 feet. Uh, uh, we had a bit of a shock on the way. Uh, we were supposed to have an uh, automatic pilot, but to uh, reduce the, the weight and not uh, that the enemy get the Norden bomb site, uh, we took it out along with the uh, lower turret and uh, all the uh, long range uh, communications. That uh, was that uh, uh, when they took out the uh, uh, Norden bomb site, they took out part of the uh, automatic pilot. And uh, that's when we just discovered we didn't have an automatic pilot. <laughs> 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 uh, there wasn't anything real exciting going into Japan. Uh, we passed uh, underneath uh, or over uh, a uh, Japanese uh, four engines um, flying boat. Uh, and, uh, and uh, they apparently didn't see us, which we were happy about. And then we veered course uh, to avoid a, a couple of uh, freighters. Um, uh, and uh, we arrived over Japan without a, any problem. Uh, we drifted into uh, 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 about 15 miles north of our of Japan, and uh, our target was the uh, bombardier's dream. Uh, we had an uh, incendiary bomb, and uh, the whole nest northwest part of Tokyo was uh, our target. Uh, and uh, our job was to try and set fire to Tokyo and also uh, set up some kind of a reference for the planes that were uh, following us and 
going to uh, Kobe and uh, Nagoya uh, uh, in uh, uh, we were able to do that uh, I don't know I've never have heard how much damage we did to fire around why but uh, uh, on the way in, we weren't uh, sighted. Uh, we passed over uh, uh, the uh, 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 shore and so forth, and uh, uh, for, uh, for some reason, uh, I was uh, uh, very uh, pleased to see how uh, it was. Uh, Beautiful, pretty. Everything was in uh, looked like order. People were on the shore waving at us, and uh, uh, as we uh, approached, uh, Fred Fred Bramer, the bombardier, had uh, picked out a uh, IP point that uh, he would use to uh, drop the uh, incendiary bombs and. Uh, uh, we turned uh, south uh, and went over to the west side of Tokyo, which is pretty big. Uh, yeah. And uh, when uh, Fred uh, Bramer uh, caught sight of the point that he picked out, why well, he notified the colonel over the microphone and or the that uh, yeah, what it was, and so Colonel Durnell pulled up uh, to uh, uh, 1,500 feet, and uh, Fred bombed, uh, uh, dropped his bombs, and uh, on the way down from 1,500, uh, there was a, 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 a few uh, anti-aircraft uh, uh, went off on the side, and uh, one uh, went off above us. Uh, it didn't do any damage, but it did just shake us up a little bit. Now, there's a, a famous book and uh, turned into a movie called 30 Seconds Over Tokyo. How long were you actually over Tokyo on your bomb run? Uh, I've thought about that quite pretty often, uh, but uh, I figured it was about seven minutes. Yeah, seven, eight minutes. Uh, at, uh, and uh, on the way out, uh, we weren't jumped. Uh, uh, one of my jobs was to keep the Paul Leonard the gunner in the back uh, of an airplane to the, uh, that I could see. Mm -hmm. uh, I had uh, 38 airplanes counted at one time, but they were all... <laughs> Above and uh, apparently they didn't see us. Uh, That's good. Some of the following airplanes, like uh, Brick Holtz from uh, uh, and uh, uh, he was jumped by some uh, one. Uh, I don't know what airplane it was, but uh, they were shooting a a um, bullet that. Uh, we figured out it was probably like a 22 because he said they bounced off the wing. Didn't penetrate. No damage to America, uh, any of the following airplanes. After the bomb run, you made it safely out of uh, Japan. Now, the plan was to go to China, fly to an air base in China. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Uh, uh, to try and uh, alert, not to alert the uh, Japanese that were, did see us, we uh, flew uh, on a course of about uh, 180 degrees south uh, for maybe 75 miles. And it was uh, far enough out where you could still see the island chain. That, uh, there again, we were flying at about average height of about uh, 200 feet. Mm -hmm. And uh, 
uh, without the autopilot, we had the man and the whole thing. Uh, one of us had to watch the tachometer because we had the uh, engines uh, lean back so far that uh, if uh, one of them even coughed, uh, well, it was going to go dead, and uh, that's not a very good place to be. Uh, but, uh, Fortunately, nothing like that happened. Uh, 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 when we made our tour, uh, our turn toward uh, China, uh, uh, Hank uh, Potter, the navigator, who was trying to take uh, uh, some kind of a position report, but uh, in flying so low, uh, the drift meter was covered up with sea spray. Yeah, there was a high overcast and he couldn't take a sun shot, so he had, just had to give us a um, magnetic heading and, uh, to uh, get to uh, China. And uh, he did a heck of a job because uh, he came out to about just about where we wanted to go. Now, on that flight to China, Hank Potter actually handed you a note. Do you remember that? Yes. Uh, uh, Hank had passed the note up to me and uh, said, uh, on the note said, uh, uh, according to my figures, uh, we we're going to end up about 180 miles short of the Chinese coast. Uh, and at that time, well, Colonel Doolittle uh, said, well, um, we'll have to use our uh, ditching procedure. And, and no, nobody was interested in ditching because one of the uh, things that added to making you more scared was uh, you could see these big old sharks taking a sun bath. Uh, 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 on the uh, top of the water, almost. Uh, um, we also talked about, Colonel uh, uh, Luther also talked about uh, how if he had the ditch uh, and the ocean was uh, pretty calm, he was going to, uh, to, to try to land in the smooth, uh, in between the smooth uh, uh, area between the, the, the moving waves. And uh, if it was fairly uh, rough and so forth, he said, I'm going to have to try to land along with the, the wave. And fortunately, we didn't have to worry about that. <laughs> yes, sir. Uh, because uh, uh, as we reached the point that Hank uh, said that we would be out of fuel, uh, we began to notice that the ocean was uh, getting a little bit uh, milky, a bit mud colored. And uh, it uh, gave us the idea that maybe we had a tailwind. Uh, and it turned out that we did have a good tailwind because uh, of the big storm that was over China uh, developed a wind that they called the kamikaze wind that blows from east to west. And uh, uh, that coupled along with the point that uh, the water was changing color, well, we uh, I thought maybe we were getting close to the land, and that turned out to be true. Uh, now, were all of the planes able to make it to the Chinese coast? Yeah. Uh, as we approached the uh, Chinese coast, uh, you could see this big wall. It was a, a, a warm front, and uh, uh, we had to go on instruments. So Colonel Doolittle climbed up to 9,000 feet and uh, uh, followed uh, Hank's uh, heading uh, to go back a little bit. Uh, there was supposed to have been a Homer station at uh, Chu Sin, which was the name of the place that uh, we were to gas up. 
and go on to Ch uh, Kunming, uh, where the uh, American volunteer group was uh, stationed. Well, the airplane carrying the Homer that we were to use and was set up uh, on uh, uh, 4495 kilocycles, uh, crashed on the way there. And uh, so consequently, we couldn't raise any kind of a, a navigational aid. And the uh, colonel decided we'd just stay at 9,000 feet and uh, uh, run out of fuel, which we came pretty close to doing. Uh, uh, now you still had to bail out of the aircraft. Uh, what was it? Uh, what, were, what was it going through your mind as you stood at that door, looking into the darkness, and knowing that you had to jump out into the dark and into the rain that night? Well, first off, you're you're scared all the time anyway, uh, and uh, you're wondering what number one. Uh, if the chute's going to work. <laughs> and uh, number two, uh, uh, are you going to be able to uh, bail out successfully? Uh, and the next thing is that the, the big front uh, was generating a lot of wind and uh, uh, rain, lightning. Uh, that, uh, uh, how are you, you going to be able to tell uh, at night uh, what what you're going to hit when you bail out. Uh, so uh, that all coupled together, <laughs> was, uh, so there's a lot of things going through your mind. <laughs> For sure. Uh, and, uh, but uh, fortunately, uh, we, we all bailed out uh, successfully, and uh, there was a uh, uh, one self-infected uh, injury. Uh, in, uh, in my case, uh, I pulled the ripcord so hard that uh, I gave myself a black eye. <laughs> <laughs> and, and where did you end up landing that night? Where did you end up landing that night? Uh, and, well, one of the good breaks that uh, I had was that uh, eased uh, my biggest concern is uh, what am I going to land on or how and where. Uh, as it turned out, uh, my chute drifted over a, a pine tree and uh, I ended up hanging off about 12 feet in the tree. Uh, and uh, uh, all my worries about hitting the ground were uh, out of the way. <laughs> I spent uh, the night in the tree uh, for a couple of reasons. Uh, it was a pretty mountainous territory, and uh, the other was uh, he couldn't see the ground because of all the fog and so forth. So uh, I managed to pull my chute in and make a kind of a hammock affair for my legs, so they wouldn't go to sleep. Uh, and I, I know I dozed off, but I didn't uh, sleep. Uh, the next morning, uh, the major part of the storm had passed, and uh, I was able to get an idea of uh, uh, my bearings and uh, what uh, uh, I might have to do next. Uh, in the uh, case of uh, one gentleman, uh, he, after he bailed out and hit the ground, uh, uh, he sat down and uh, uh, lit a cigarette. And uh, when he was ready, he flipped it out like that. And he thought that he would see where the ground was. Well, he saw it go out, and he kept it uh, <laughs> <laughs> and he was on the very first uh, part of a uh, high part of a uh, uh, peak. <laughs> but, uh, 
there were several injuries, uh, broken ankles and uh, arms. Uh, uh, one crew, the, they hit the water with their wheels down and it threw them, a pilot and a co-pilot out through the windshield. Uh, and uh, they were pretty bad uh, hurt, but uh, uh, the Chinese uh, uh, medical people that they did run across uh, were, were a great help. Yes, sir. And that next morning when you got out of the tree, what did you do? Uh, well, after uh, I climbed down, uh, I repacked the uh, chute and made it into a backpack up there. And uh, we all had compasses, and uh, we knew that if we walked uh, west, that we'd be headed toward uh, uh, unoccupied uh, China, uh, and you'd be headed in the right direction. Uh, so uh, I started out walking west. Uh, and uh, it, be, being uh, uh, really scared about uh, what uh, to do next, I decided uh, that uh, I wasn't going to look for a railroad or that I was going to stay uh, to the high country to keep from being captured. And, uh, it turned out that uh, after walking all day, I came out on a cliff, uh, and uh, down below was a uh, little cantonment that had the Chinese national flag flying above it. So I walked down there, and uh, uh, I was accosted by a Chinese soldier. Uh, he took me to a building that uh, uh, was empty except for a table. And on the table was a sketch that somebody had drawn with a two-tailed two airplane with five parachutes coming out of it. And, uh, so I finally got him to take me where he took the gentleman that drew the picture. Yeah. So we went uh, maybe a hundred yards or so, and there was another building that uh, we went in, and it was so uh, foggy inside from uh, candle smoke you, that you couldn't see her hardly anything. And uh, uh, when I entered, I saw something out of the corner of my eye, uh, another human. Uh, and uh, about that time, uh, they lit a couple more candles, and uh, you could see uh, through this little overcast that uh, yeah, it was Colonel Duda. Uh, what, what other assistance did the Chinese provide to you and uh, the Doolittle crew? Mm -hmm. what, kind of, what other kinds of assistance did the Chinese provide to you and the Doolittle crew? Uh, I'm not hearing you. Oh, uh, the Chinese had been a big help up to that time, and uh, we were looking for something a little better. But, uh, it was a, a, a great help. Uh, Colonel Doolittle was very interesting in finding out where the rest of the crews were and uh, how kind of condition they were in. Uh, uh, and uh, he got the, the uh, leader of the place where we were to take us to another place where they had a telephone. Uh, and uh, the telephone was very helpful because the, the American volunteer group had uh, quartered off the country in a network that uh, uh, was very helpful to their fighter pilots. Uh, and they had, had it by telephone. Uh, and uh, uh, 
Colonel Duda didn't want to leave the telephone until he knew uh, to his satisfaction where everybody was and what kind of condition they were in. And uh, uh, I know uh, for a fact that uh, uh, the 10th Air Force, which was in New Delhi, India, had sent the uh, teletypes to the embassy there in uh, Chongqing, which was the uh, uh, capital, uh, provisional capital at that time, uh, uh, for him to get on an airplane and come, uh, go home. Uh, but he, he refused until he was satisfied that uh, he could uh, live with uh, the number of people that, what, where they were and what they were doing. And how long was it before you finally returned to U.S. Uh, controlled territory? How long before you returned to U.S. controlled territory? Uh, to the States. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, in uh, the uh, effort to get people to go on a mission, we were told that uh, if you survived the mission, yeah, you would get to come home. Well, uh, it didn't work out that way. <laughs> <laughs> there were 26 of us uh, that uh, uh, never received orders. And uh, so we were kind of loose end. And, uh, uh, when uh, they started to uh, warm up uh, the airwaves uh, for pilots to uh, go on the hump, there were six of us that uh, decided that was something they'd like to do. So uh, it was uh, 14 months before I, I got to come home. And how long was it before the, the Raiders got back together again? Uh, it was when all the Raiders didn't get back together again until uh, uh, the party that uh, uh, Colonel Doolittle had promised us that uh, uh, early on. He had said that uh, if, uh, we all get back, uh, when we all get back, uh, I will give you the, the biggest party you ever had. Yeah. Well, uh, it, that was true uh, in 1945. Uh, everybody uh, that, that uh, could be there uh, was at Miami, Florida. Uh, and, uh, he uh, had, she had set up the thing with a friend of his who uh, was the owner of the McFadden Doverhill Hotel at that time. Uh, and, uh, uh, so uh, we ended up there and uh, the, it was a very nice party. Uh, uh, and, and somebody along said, uh, uh, we ought to do this again. Uh, and uh, uh, Colonel Dutton said, no, no, wait a minute, fellas. Uh, said, I'm paying for all this, and I, I can't afford it. <laughs> uh, and, but anyway, it evolved into an annual meeting that uh, we uh, uh, went to uh, bases mainly. Uh, and uh, after that, when the uh, uh, money got a little scarce and the, the bases were closing and so forth, we uh, ended up uh, being invited to different cities uh, and to uh, uh, pay back the city for uh, the, the, the privilege of having a reunion there. Uh, we awarded uh, a traffic safety award uh, and we did that for a few years and uh, uh, first the 
that got uh, a little bit out of style, uh, and uh, we were closing bases and so forth. So uh, we decided that the best way to give something back to the city was to be develop a scholarship program, which uh, we did, and uh, we still have today. The Doolittle Raiders have a tradition of doing toast, and you have your tradition of doing toast to the uh, Raiders who've uh, passed on, and General Doolittle purchased and donated a, a bottle of 1896 cognac. Do you remember that mm -hmm. for the final toast? Uh, can you explain to the students what the final toast is and what the significance of that is? Well, uh, The Hennessy Company, uh, their product is especially is cognac, had laid down a, 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 I guess you'd call it a batch or whatever, in 1896, which was the birthday of uh, Colonel Doodell. And, uh, well, uh, uh, through the years that we had the union, the reunion, uh, we had one at uh, Tucson, Arizona. Uh, and Tucson presented uh, us with uh, 16 silver goblets that had the name written uh, on uh, one side straight up. And he turned it over and it was written uh, upside down. So he turned it over. Uh, Anyway, um, uh, we uh, they had a toast each time at the uh, and the, the bottle of uh, cognac was um, uh, taken along with it to the Air Force Academy. Uh, Colonel Doolittle uh, uh, got permission to leave them there at the, uh, the academy. Uh, and give them to him. Uh, and uh, after a while, uh, uh, when uh, things got uh, sec real security minded, uh, it was a bad idea because nobody could get on the base, uh, ever had, had trouble getting on the base to uh, see. Uh, visiting the commanding uh, the, the academy, and uh, along with the demonstration of the, the, uh, the cups, uh, and uh, we finally moved the cups to the museum at Wright Patterson, and uh, that's where they are today, and. Uh, Along with the cups, there's a, a bottle that uh, the Hennessy Company had uh, uh, given uh, Colonel Lunel, uh, and it's there today. Uh, it, uh, uh, I mean, the, the ceremony that we had uh, for the last uh, toast. Uh, they opened the bottle, and uh, uh, Dave uh, Thatcher and uh, Ed uh, Saylor and I got to taste it. Uh, and, uh, according to the Hennessy people, it doesn't uh, cognac doesn't age; it stays the same. And, and uh, uh, we got a, a chance to taste it. But uh, the only objection that we had was that uh, uh, it was kind of skimpy. And, uh, <laughs> 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 but it was very smooth. Colonel Doolittle, is there anything else you'd like the ACSC students to know about the, either the Doolittle Raid or, or the Raiders themselves that we haven't already discussed today? Is there anything else you'd like to share with the students about the Doolittle Raid or the Raiders themselves? Yeah. 
Well, uh, I might talk about uh, what happened to Colonel Doolittle. Uh, after the raid, uh, he, he was very dejected. And uh, uh, the place where the airplane crashed uh, uh, was uh, up on the mountainside, and, and uh, it uh, didn't burn, so uh, we knew we were pretty close to being out of fuel when uh, we had to bail out. But uh, uh, Colonel Doolittle uh, uh, made comment to uh, Paul Leonard, the crew chief, that. Uh, uh, he uh, was going to be court-martialed. And uh, uh, Paul Leonard uh, was a very fatherly-like type a guy, a good guy, uh, said, uh, well, C Colonel, that's not going to happen. And, uh, they're going to promote you to a general and uh, award you the uh, Medal of Honor. And uh, Paul said, uh, well, uh, if you ever get another airplane, uh, I want to be your crew chief. And uh, Colonel Doolittle said, that was the first time that tears came to my eyes. And what Paul said uh, came true. Well, Colonel Doolittle, uh, 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 unfortunately, uh, Paul did become, or fortunately, he did become uh, Colonel Doolittle's co pilot, or chief. But uh, yeah, over in Africa, uh, during a, a German air raid, Paul uh, jumped into a, a bomb crater, and uh, a German bomb hit the same crater, and Paul was, lost his life. Well, Lieutenant Colonel Cole, thank you for your uh, comments this morning, or this afternoon. Thank you for sharing your uh, experiences from the Doolittle Raid. We appreciate you sharing that with us. And I think I speak for everyone here that, uh, that we all seek to live by the example that you and uh, the World War II uh, veterans uh, set for us. And thank you for all you've done for our country. Everyone, please thank me. Uh, join me in thanking Lieutenant Colonel Cole this morning.